after uh, Shavuot break. So let's, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone by giving you the opportunity <coughs> together, collectively, to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> um, today, I, I'm flying, uh, right after this class, I have a flight at 5. So I'm going to teach until 3.10. We'll go without a break, just uh, 40, 50 minutes. And, uh, and then maybe I'll make the flight. Okay, so I'll tell you next time <laughs> if I did or not. I'm flying to Ose for a conference on biological physics. And well, I'll get a chance to present our recent work in front of my learned colleagues and many students who are attracted to this rapidly growing field called biological physics, which has a reflection inside biology, which is how should we call it in biology? Systems biology? Future biology. <laughs> because I think in the future, it's not that the system biology will be one small part of biology, but that the, 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 the kind of answer in biology will change. Molecular biology, the answer is a molecule or some molecules that do something together and a story about how they do it. And the change will be that, that it will be a molecule, a group of molecules, a circuit to do something, and a kind of uh, um, mathematical understanding like we're developing here. And uh, they'll understand it in terms of generalizable principles. So I think that's why I call it future biology. The bottom line of what's an accepted explanation in biology evolves. And of course, it's been like that in biology in many fields already for decades, like in the field of evolutionary biology and, and understanding neurons with the Hodgkin-Huxley equations and physiology. And now it's the turn of molecular biology. All right, uh, so we're here. So in the arc of the course, um, this is the nec le ne next class is the last, last class. And we might add another class because it's exceptionally short, just nine classes. If you remember, in the arc of the course, we started with uh, network motifs, elementary circuits with the f defined functions, and we analyzed them. And then we had another few lessons about robustness, the principle that biological circuits are designed so their essential function in is insensitive to the naturally occurring fluctuations in the, the components and the environment. So, and now it's time to start the last third of the class which uh, has several topics. Um, the first one we'll do today is about optimality. Now this is a, a very interesting thing. Optimality means uh, that um, a biological design within certain constraints um, has the optimizes a function. And this function comes from the theory of evolution. Since organisms um, pass on their some aspects of their in, uh, information to their children with some mistakes. Children are different. Some of them make more babies, survive, make more babies. They pass on their information. Some of those are they're different. Some of those survive. So there's some differential survival. There's a, a differential survival in, and uh, making babies. You see that evolution has an insighted and optimizing feature. The ones that survive and make babies are the ones that are most likely to have their genetic material rep represented in the future generations. So we'll try to formalize that. Now, I just want to say that there's two extreme opinions. One of them is that everything is optimal. Everything that exists is the way it should be. We live in the best of all possible worlds. worlds. The other extreme is everything <coughs> is a historical accident. It's like that because there's a long history of accidents that made us what we are now. There's no plan. Talking about optimality <coughs> is misguided because you can make uh, terrible mistakes, think something is the best, but actually it's not so good. Those are two extreme opinions. Of course, there's a continuum in biology. It, biology is a historical science. Most of our traits come from our parents. And at the same time, there's this optimizing force of natural selection. So it's always fruitful, I think, to think about optimality as a possible hypothesis and try to 
test it, where the interesting thing is not whether th something is optimal, but more what are the constraints under which it's optimal. Let us give you an example. Dolphins have lungs. You can imagine maybe it's not optimal for dol dolphins to have lungs, since they live in the water. S but it might take a long, long, long time for them, for those mammals who went to the sea, to lose those lungs and develop gills. Too long. Okay, so that's a constraint. They have lungs. But within that constraint, the shape of that lu their lungs, the volume of their lungs, their ability to grab oxygen <coughs> could be optimal for the conditions in which they live. So that's an example of a constraint. It has to do with time scales. Right, so we all just have to define the constraints that we're optimizing over. Um, there's other famous examples of non-optimality, like a, a nerve that has to go over a bone, like this in, ma in mammals. And in a giraffe neck, this nerve has to go, ah, down, like that. You can say, why not just make a shortcut? Right? But again, it's a historical constraint, apparently, that keeps it in this strange configuration. Um, any, any questions about this concept of optimality before we try to define it more precisely? He paused, waiting for at least one question. So the question is, how can you know it's not optimal? Maybe you could engineer a giraffe and test it. Maybe it has some function. That's a great comment. In fact, I think it's impossible to prove that something is not optimal for something, for some condition. And that's a problem of saying something is not optimal. But to, um, to make a hypothesis saying something is optimal for a certain set of conditions is a, is a, is a hypothesis you can disprove experimentally. And that's why it's interesting. Science, in, by the way, in science you can never prove, you can only disprove. That's Karl Popper. Yeah. Um, didn't, didn't this uh, false also lead to things like eugenics? Like yeah, thank you. So there's a, thank you very much. The, what you're saying is the history of the term optimality and the thinking of optimality has some nasty political um, resonances, for example. Uh, maybe we can improve the human race by ex exterminating people who are crippled who are mentally disabled, who are a certain ethnicity. Because we can select, we can do the natural selection, etc. So th this is uh, uh, something, yeah, can you say more? Well, so how do you differentiate between optimized and adaptive? Like, what's the difference? What's the difference between optimized and adapted? Yeah. Right, and I'll try to make a, a kind of rigorous definition of optimality in a certain limited context. And it has to do with adaptation, too. So this history, thank you for raising that to acknowledge. The so I, I just want to say something about science, of course, can be used. Science knowledge is, an, it is a neutral thing. Uh, the way it's used politically is a political thing. The uh, choices we make in science about what to work on are political decisions. For instance, if I decide to work on malaria, it's different than if I decide to work on cancer. It's a political choice. Um, us here, uh, we don't, it's science, we, not, we don't study the political contexts of our ideas, which is, I think, a big uh, lack for us, because we are in a position to uh, communicate what science is, I think, best to society, help uh, d our democratic society make um, good choices. So I really appreciate that you brought it up. And by the way, why did I draw this uh, wheat here, not only Shavuot? It's, um, we, we uh, human beings, uh, uh, the Cultural Revolution about 10,000 years ago was you know, one of the biggest technological transitions when there was uh, domesticated crops, everything changed. Uh, the difference between wild wheat and domesticated wheat, apparently, major difference, is that wild wheat, um, when it's ripe, it breaks, and then it can spread the seeds. But domesticated wheat doesn't. It waits for you to cut it down. And that apparently is a, is a single mu mutation, this difference. It was selected in our ancestors around this area who collected the uh, wheat around their camps, apparently what, what they selected grew, it became. This is a, a process of natural selection 
artificial selection, right? Artificial selection. So what's optimal is also co-evolving with other organisms. Wheat now, which is a very common plant on Earth, is optimized or selected for our use now. So together we're like a symbiotic system. So it's very interesting how organisms affect each other. Emachita <laughs> was discovered here in the next building. This is the original plant. Great. It's very interesting, actually, this field of... Uh, so we have... Uh, so let's try to uh, do an experiment on optimality. I'll tell you about um, history, dolphins. So um, uh, just to set the conceptual framework a little bit. Let's, uh, uh, since the 1920s, person, people like Wright, there's a deep history of mathematical theory and evolution thinking about things like this. On the x-axis, we'll draw fitness, which is something you need to define. Something like the number of grandchildren you have. In bacteria, we'll use growth rate in an exponential growth situation. So this is Again, to define what fitness is, is an experimental challenge. And on the y-axis is some trait. Let's say, um, you know, some, something that characterizes the organism, L volume of the lung, or expression level of a protein, big already. And fitness function is says that um, if I vary this trait, and the organism will have different fitness, okay, and the uh, evolution um, will uh, select uh, this optimality means this is the selected value of the trait, maximizes fitness. For example, classic experiment on birds, this axis is the number of eggs laid in a nest. Um, this is the number of uh, grandchildren the birds have. In the 40s uh, lack uh, manipulated nests to have different number of eggs, and he found a function like this. And the, the naturally occurring number Averaged around here. So that's like a classic study in bird ecology, which has, of course, a lot of caveats, etc. Listen, what's uh, some, some things you see immediately here is, uh, for example, what happens if there's two maxima, right? What is it, mul multiple maxima? What happens if you're here? Can you go here? What's the rate of climbing here? All these questions are interesting. What's the rate? Now, if environment changes, this is depends on the environment. So, if environment changes, environment changes, then what will happen? We expect, you know, fitness drops when environment changes. So then you have to climb the hill again. So that's something we'll try to examine. How long does this take? Um, in order for these things to move, there needs to be enough genetic variation, that's to say, genetic differences between uh, members of the population in order to select something on. If everything is monolithic, you can't, you can't uh, have natural selection. Mutations occur, so naturally there is kind of a cloud of phenotypes of shapes around the maximum, and organisms that mutate r rapidly, like viruses, have a big cloud. There's a recombination, parents get together, so two parents from here get together and make a child that's here, and vice versa, so there's this variability in the population. Different creatures live in slightly variable environments, so there's this idea of different localities having different shapes, like people who live high on a mountain have different content of hemoglobin in their blood than people who live in the valley. So there's a lot of issues here that are interesting and juicy. And I'd like to tell you about an experiment It was done by Erez Dekel and myself, 2005, uh, where we tried to understand some of these questions about time scales, m even measuring the fitness function, something where you can experimentally try to co talk about optimality. And the trait that we chose 
is the um, expression level of a protein inside E. coli, and specifically the LAC operon, which I'll tell you about, classic proteins. And for fitness, we used them in an experimental situation where we can really define fitness. It's not, the na it's not natural, it's ex experimental. It's a test tube where you put the E. coli in and they grow exponentially in the test tube. So the fitness in our situation will be the exponential growth rate alpha. Number of cells grows with rate alpha. So if this is time, and this is number of cells, and they start from N0, this is log number of cells. They'll, they'll grow exponentially until food runs out with a slope of alpha. If I have a mutant that grows faster, it'll take over the test tube. It'll reach, it'll finish the food before the competitors. See? So the growth rate alpha is critical here for passing your genetic material. That's going to be our fitness. Is this concept, did I explain this concept clearly enough? Fitness function? So that's, that, that'll be our um, framework. So we will, our model system, again, we choose the best studied system, really, in bio, I think, in biology, the LAC operon, which is the system in which Monon Jacob in, in 1961 discovered the secret that transcription factors can bind DNA, regulate protein level. This system is inside E. coli, right? Inside E. coli. And it, it's made of three genes called Z, Y, and A. They're all expressed together inside E. coli, right? There's a repressor gene, I, that makes a repressor protein. This repressor protein, oh, the purpose of the system is to uh, use a sugar called lactose. It's milk sugar. That's what makes the milk sweet. Lactose. And the way this works is that this enzyme here, this is the bacterial wall. Y, this Y, makes a pump that allows the sugar lactose, which will symbolize as L, go into the cell. This sugar lactose looks like a six carbons connected to five carbons. Glucose connected to galactose. And this enzyme Z here cuts this bond. Glucose and galactose, sending them to be eaten by the cell. It's called beta-galactosidase, cuts that bond. And what A does is not clear. <laughs> Believe it or not, after a hundred years of studying this system, or more or less, there's some clues. If you want, I can discuss what it might be. And this lactose, um, a derivative of lactose also um, inhibits the inhibition. So when lactose is it goes in, more of these proteins are made. And so you see this is a system, a biological a classic kind of situation where the sugar induces the genes that break, pump it in and break it down. Thank you. So the inhibition is not complete to begin with, and when there's no sugar around, E. coli makes one copy of this RNA every nine generations, making a small, really tiny, tiny, stochastically different amount of per permeases so they can import lactose and break it down in order to start the whole thing otherwise. Good point. Um, and one another lovely thing about this system is that Monon Jacob, who, it, uh, who studied it, developed this neat chemical toolkit so you can uh, do things to the system for example, there is a molecule called IPTG that is what's called a gratuitous inducer. 
turns the system on, but is not used for growth or anything like that. IPTG looks, it looks like lactose, it looks like a uh, 6 connected to something with sulfur in it, so it looks chemically similar to uh, uh, lactose, but it binds very tightly to this repressor, and just like the natural inducer makes, fools the, it, it thinks there's, there's sugar around, but it can't use this IPTG for anything. It's like a gratuitous inducer, kilo, inducia bechinam. And of course, lac Z, so the whole purpose of this sugar is to give carbon and energy to make new cells, it's for growth. When you delete the lac genes, the E. coli can't grow on lactose, that's why they're called lac. They can grow on many other sugars, but not on lactose. So that's the way it was discovered by mutations, etc. So this is uh, the biological system. Okay, so let's, uh, so let's uh, try to calculate the fitness function. And I, what I want to say is that the uh, natural, uh, when you get E. coli from the E. coli strain bank, the wild type makes Z wild type equals 60,000 copies of lac Z protein per cell. So this is when fully induced. So you put in maximum amount of sugar, it makes 60,000. And the question I want to ask is, why 60,000? not 50,000 or 70,000. How can we calculate or understand this number, 60,000? That's the trait we'll try to understand, the number of proteins. Is it optimal? If it's optimal, what is it optimal for? What it, why 60,000, not 50,000, right? This why question. Okay, so Let's try to calculate. So what we'll do, our program will be to calculate, calculate the fitness function to predict the optimum as a function of the amount of sugar in the environment. And three, test by experimental laboratory evolution. So I'll teach you how you do evolution experiments in the laboratory with E. coli. Um, all right, so I'm going to erase the system and we, the fitness equals cost, sorry, benefit, minus cost. So we're going to, the fitness, which is the growth rate, we're going to break it down into benefit and cost. Benefit is the advantage in growth rate due to the function of the protein LAC-Z, or the LAC-Opron, LAC-ZYA, on the growth rate, and cost is how much you grow slower if you just make the protein in situations where it doesn't do anything. So we're going to break it down to two parts. Cost equals the decrease in the growth rate when the lac proteins are made without there's sugar around. So I need to have a situation where I can make those proteins, but they don't have the sugar to work on. They're just making them. How can I do that? With IPTG, with this tool that turns the system on, but the cell can't use it to grow. And experiments show that it doesn't affect growth. It doesn't increase or decrease. It's like invisible. Yeah. Total, total. It's around 3 million. So this is a few percent, this is a few percent, a few percent of the cell protein. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, let's imagine that I change the number of proteins from 60,000 to 50,000, that's 10,000 proteins, that's order of 1%. 
if the cell grows 1% slower, okay, in 100 generations, it takes over the cell. So 1% change in growth rate is a very selectable. 0.1% change in growth rate is also very selectable. 0.01% is also very selectable. What's the minimum selectable advantage in E. coli? So we don't know exactly, but there's indirect evidence suggesting that differences as small as 10 to the minus 6 in growth rate are selectable. That's about where genetic drift overtakes selection. 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. That's judged by... Uh, depending on the cell, right? This is a... a the number of generations? Yeah, right, and population size. So it looks like from looking at DNA sequences, uh, mutations that change the sequence but don't make a change in coding, uh, it looks like the you can uh, you can estimate that in nature that's the minimum selective advantage, 10 to the minus 6. But that's indirect. I mean, I'd love to have an experiment that measures this. But I think it's an important number. Is it just a matter of uh, threshold? Because like, if there is something select, if you have uh, 1 to the uh, minus, I don't know, 10, the, uh, the, the random drift is uh, to both directions. So if you have pressure in one direction, eventually, eventually it will take over. But yeah. it will, will just take... So the question is, uh, is this a sharp threshold when you say something is selectable or not selectable? It's not a sharp threshold, it's a continuous function. At this number 10 to the minus 6, a mutation that has an advantage 10 to the minus 6 has, um, in, in the population sizes that exist in nature, apparently, has a 50% chance to make it um, uh, to, be to be fixed. And it's a kind of a continuous function above that. But already 10 to the minus 5 will be fixed with a very high probability because it's, yeah. So that's, it's kind of a continuous uh, number. All right, so let's, do, let's look at how the cost looks like. So here we go, a measurement of protein cost, the cost of needless proteins, making proteins when they're not needed. So uh, it is took the E. coli, put them on a, in a medium that has another carbon source, glycerol, used IPTG to make... proteins using IPTG. So this axis 1 means 60,000 per cell. And this is relative decrease in growth rate compared to the situation of not making any proteins. Right? And this function looks like this. It has a phase where it's growing linear, linearly, and then a phase where it kind of looks like it's going up very quickly. So here, you pay some growth for every protein you make. About you grow about a million times slower for every protein you make. But then, every protein you make has increasing costs because apparently, you take away resources from other systems. So there's some increasing cost. Uh, and this function uh, mathematically can be fit pretty well by something like this. It has this linear term, and this term goes to infinity when this goes to zero, which is at some m here. So you can't make more, for example, we know we can't make more than 30% of the biomass in unneeded protein, the cells die. They can't stand that. Yeah. It's decreasing all the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, that's not by mistake. It is. It is around one. That's not by chance. Yeah. For this protein, you have to measure this for every protein because there are different sizes. This, of course, both Z and Y and A. Yeah. Yeah. You can have mutants. Uh, oh, okay. With IPTG, you can only reach here, and then there's other mutants that we have that can go up, up, up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, no, no. You can go beyond, and I'll show you in the experiments. Yeah, you but if you go beyond your, uh, beyond your price, it's really high. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So price becomes very high, and that's why why uh, if uh, you can't get more and more benefit by making more and more of this protein, it's 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 it hits a wall. Th that's very important. This nonlinear form that is increasing costs. Because otherwise, you have a certain cost per protein, a certain benefit per protein. And if benefit increases is more, per protein is more than the cost per protein, just make more and more and more and more and more of them. 
But it doesn't work that way. Cost per protein starts going up when you have more and more proteins. You see, it's very important, this curvature. So that's something we didn't know, for example, when we started this experiment. Nobody's ever measured this. It was nice to see this function. It was, it was, protein cost was known that this exists, but to measure it like this. OK, so that's the cost. Now what about benefit? Benefit equals relative increase in alpha, in growth rate, when Z proteins are made with L la lactose sugar around. So this, unlike the cost, the benefits depends on the environment. What's the environment? How much sugar lactose there is. The more sugar lactose, the more benefit. If there's no sugar lactose, there's no benefit. If there's sugar lactose, there's a benefit. Also depends on the amount of proteins you make. If you don't make any of this lac proteins, you can put a lot of lactose in, doesn't matter. So it's a function of two things. So the cost, the benefit is a function of Z and L. And this again, uh, we measured. It's some number times the amount of proteins you make times the usual michaelis menten function of the lactose. K is about 0.4 millimolar. Delta is about 17%. Eta is about, oh, I should tell you that making 60,000 proteins per cell is a cost of about 5%. So you grow 60,000 proteins per cell when you don't need them, of lac proteins, you grow 5% slower. That's like the order of magnitude you were talking about. So it's 5% slower. Making full um, 60,000 proteins with infinite lactose means you grow 17% faster. So that's the cost and the benefit. That's the 17%. The numbers you can measure from the experiments. By the way, to measure growth rate experimentally, it is that to develop a new technique to measure growth rate with very high accuracy. You take a 96 well plate with 96 different cultures in him. How many people have ever seen a 96 well plate? Okay, this is the standard biology now. <laughs> you grow in a checkerboard pattern the two strains you want to compare with lactose, without lactose, for example, with IPG, with that. So you checkerboard pattern. And you grow them in a fluorimeter that measures this optical density, which is light scattering, which is number of cells, and you get this exponential curve over time. It measures it every few minutes. You get very exquisite measurements by averaging over 96 experiments. You get to about half a percent uh, accuracy in growth rate. And if somebody here can invent a method where you get to 10 to the minus 6 accuracy in growth rate, you'll open up a new field in evolutionary biology. <laughs> the, the limit is not technological, it's biological, reproducible abilities. So this means the benefit increases the more proteins you have, the more benefit linearly. And it's, ha it's a function of how much lactose there is in the environment. This K, by the way, comes from the pumps. The pumps give you this 0.4 millimolar. So we have cost and benefit. Fitness is benefit minus cost. We have those two functions. So we can plot what the fitness function looks like, right? So what does the fitness function look like? <coughs> fitness. protein level. So it looks like this, or fitness or whatever, is um, delta Z L over K plus L minus eta Z 1 minus Z over M. This function looks like this. It of course starts from zero. When there's no Z, it's zero. It goes up and then it goes down. Zero here means um, that uh, you grow just, this is the growth rate without lactose, without protein. This is just in, the, in this particular medium that we're growing the cells in. Water, salt, some glycerol. And this is for lactose, let's say equals one millimolar. So you give a certain concentration, it looks like this. The optimum is here. It turns out that 
it's more, if one millimolar gives you more Z than the 60,000, 60,000 you get if you, 60,000 is when you, is when you have 0.6 millimolar. So that's the concentration given continuously that gives you an optimum at 60,000 per cell. And uh, if you have very low amounts of lactose, it looks like this. What does this mean? So what will happen? In this situation, the cells will tend to lose their lac system, delete the genes, throw it away, if you grow them for a long, long time, because making the lac system, proteins, doesn't give you any such. So this is, happens at L less than L critical. And, uh, of course, I, uh, how do we calculate this? You need to find the optimum, right? This is the optimum, is when this equals zero, like you learned in, in, in calculus to maximize a function. It's derivative, it's zero. So let's, let's take the derivative of this function. We can take it, this, the derivative of this function. So what happens when I der derivatize by z? z falls away. What's the derivative of this? Turns out that this is it. Uh, you can uh, try to do that. And so the uh, this has to be equal to zero. So the z optimum is a function that is looks like this. This is that function. Where? Yeah, okay, so let's, if you derivatize this thing, this what you mean? What, what missing term, where? If you derivatize this thing, you have minus eta over 1 minus z over m, minus 1 over z over m squared, minus eta z times 1 over m. And so when you do the... What? So I solved this equation. <coughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, delta. Of course, this is the classic pl case where you can make a math mathematical error. So, if anybody has the book, this is a good time to check equation 10.2.7 or something like that. Seven point. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, actually, what happens when L is very, very small? L is very, very small then benefit goes down, 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 but cost doesn't change, you see? So at some point, growth rate becomes negative, always ne becomes negative. When L is zero, for example, it's negative, the, the, the relative change in growth. And you can calculate that critical L. So when, when does Z optimal equal zero? The answer is, in what L? L critical, which is something that I don't remember right now. It has to do with K times something with eta and L. And it's about 0.05 millimolar, right? We want basically eta over L, delta K plus L over L, to be equal to 1, that's when it's 0. And that means that um, eta over delta 1 plus K over L equals 1, K over L equals 1 minus eta over delta, L equals K divided by 1 minus eta over delta. So some, some that's this critical number, something like that. This is, I made a mistake here somewhere, but you can do this calculation. If I explain myself, you just calculate when this becomes negative, what L, when, when this square root is bigger than 1, then it becomes negative. Okay, so you can calculate this function. So there's a prediction. There's a prediction for, this is the lactose in the environment, and this is Z optimal. I'm just plotting the function over there. The prediction is like this. Up to L, below L critical, <coughs> If evolution optimizes, there should be no protein expression below 0.05 millimolar lactose in the environment, given constantly. And then it goes up, 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 like that. And it reaches Z wild type, 60,000 per cell at 0.6 millimolar. So that's a prediction. It's based on measuring the cost and benefit inside the wild type cells. 
Right? It makes sense. The more lactose in the environment, the more you can afford to make Z proteins because their benefit increases and you can pay more of the cost. But you can never get to infinity because the cost rises like this at some point, no matter how much lactose you have. You can't, you can't uh, overcome the cost. With infinite amount of lactose? No. Why do you think they should? Yeah, it kind of saturates. The co also, the benefit saturates. So, yeah. Maybe the pumps, there's so much lactose, maybe the pumps start working too hard, throwing out protons. Maybe something like this can happen. I mean, again, when you talk about the real world, there's extra effects that can come. So we. Okay, so now let's do the experiment. So this is a prediction. If optimality works, and if we found the right constraints here, the cost and benefit, we have a hypothesis. If we take E. coli and evolve it for a long, long time in a given amount of lactose sugar, it should change its maximum expression level. It should change the 60,000. It should make mutations that change the 60,000 and make them either more or less than the 60,000 you get from the wild type. So this is a, and that should be inheritable. All its children should have the same number, right? That's, that's the prediction. So we can do that experiment, and we did that experiment. So I'll tell you how you do that experiment. Ken. Yeah, so, um, the benefit equation is Michaelis Menten enzyme kinetics, and we, we measured it, and there's a strong theory behind that. I mean, why it's Michaelis Menten enzyme kinetics? If you look at Appendix A of the book that, I s that we sent to all of you by email, it explains why it is. It's based on the collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, and you get this L over K plus L, which is basically the partition function for a sphere binding uh, another sphere. Basically something like that. So that's very clear. The cost, uh, this divergence of the cost, you can fit other functions, quadratic function, etc. They don't fit as well. You can get it also from a theory where, and that's will be in the exercises, where you have a limiting resource and the growth rate uh, goes like uh, limiting resource over K plus this limiting resource. And when, we, when you make the protein, you take away from this limiting resource. And this expression gives you that term. So it comes from, a, again, like a basically something limiting in the cell that's being depleted by making protein. The parameters were fit to the, to the data, and it fits very well. OK, so uh, laboratory evolution experiments. Use serial dilution. And Lenski is one of the pioneers of this method. And it's a very, very simple experiment, low-tech experiment. You grow the bacteria in a tube with a certain amount of lactose. And you let it grow. And next morning, you come and you take a pipette and you tra transfer 1% of the cells to a fresh tube. And they grow exponentially. And they finish the food. And the next morning, you come and you take 1% uh, of the cells. So you start the cells. And you take 1 to 100 dilution to the next, like this. And this is a great experiment. If you want to take a vacation, you, you know, you're flying away, let's say, like me to Orsay in France, and uh, you come back the next week, that's fine. The cells stay there. You continue the experiment. Every day, the cells grow 100 times because you diluted by 1 to 100. They grow 100. That's 6.6 .6 generations because 2 to the power of 6.6 .6 is 100. So it, every day, they grow 6.6 .6 generations. And in this way, you can accumulate hundreds of generations. Lenski has an experiment running for over 30 or 40,000 generations, started decades ago. Right? Now, it is set up seven tubes in parallel with seven different levels of lactose. <coughs> Each tube, let's say, with zero lactose, continues to be zero lactose. The tube with 0.1 millimolar lactose will be 0.1 millimolar. So we're seven evolution experiments in parallel, scanning seven different environments. Every few days or weeks, he takes the cells and measures how much laxity protein they're making by Western blots and enzymatic activity and what their growth rate is. 
So you can actually okay, so measure Z and alpha, every whatever you want. And you can also sequence the DNA of these bacteria. It's a big revolution nowadays. In 2005, it still wasn't, didn't exist. Now, for $1,000, you can sequence the entire genome of E. coli. The, amount, the sequencing capability of, of, uh, in science is growing faster than Moore's law in computers. In 2000, the Human Genome Project was billions of dollars to map a human genome. Now, it's a matter of $10,000. And in a few years, it will be a matter of $10, apparently, to sequence your own DNA. So that's huge impact, etc. So now I'm going to plot to you the results of the experiment. So this is generations. And this is, oh, by the way, all these tubes contain IPTG. So these cells are forced to make their maximum amount of LACZ, of protein, no matter what the lactose level is. So they're turned on to 60,000. And now, if 60,000 is too much, we expect that evolution will push it down. If it's too little, it was best to push it up. So this is, so this is uh, here's what happened. So you start with one. All the strains start with one. Here's what happened to the E. coli that were involved with zero lactose. They lost their lac genes. The time scale was about 200 generations. And these cells could no longer grow, grow, grow on lactose. If we take cells from here and try to grow them on lactose, they can't. They lost it. We forced them to make 60,000. They said, ha, we're just going to delete those genes. Indeed, when you sequence them, they deleted the genes, made a lot of different mutations that killed the system. Here are cells that are grown on 0.1 millimolar. Here are cells that are grown on 0.5 millimolar. Here are cells that are grown on one millimolar, and here are cells that were grown on five millimolar. If I plot this steady state values here on this graph, if I'll on the graph, let's say, with some error, <coughs> within experimental error, let's say. You can see the graph in the book if you want or in this paper. One unexpected thing that happened was this step in 5 millimolar. We don't understand why this happened. It's, uh, the, the theory is around here. So this is another mutation. When we looked at this strain, what happened? It changed its cost function. This, this cell, for some reason, can make proteins with lower cost. So, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> so the time scale, so what's going on here? What happens here is within a few hundred generations, E. coli are able to heritably change their system to go to what we can see within an experimental error is the optimal expression level of the lac proteins. Of course, when you stop the experiment and you look at their children, they make, they're making the same level. It'll take a few hundred generations in a new env environment for them to change it. So the rate of evolution in this case is order of magnitude of a few hundred generations. The precision is better than the, I don't know, 10% that we can measure it. The, um, now, when we sequence these bacteria, so we want to see what happened, we find something that we didn't expect also, that the population that, that gets got fixed, that is to say that took over the bacteria, is not the same. <laughs> it's actually made of, we, th we think, a hundred different kinds of mutants that co-evolve. Because when we s take the cells, we make colonies, so that each colony comes from a single individual, and we sequence those colonies, we get different mutations. Those mutations are also interesting. Some of them are in the LACZ region, and they change something that we think has to do with maybe the stability of the RNA, of the proteins that way, changing the expression. Level. Others are mutations outside of the LAC system, so effects that happen indirectly on this LAC expression. Turns out, there's, uh, for each one of these lines, there's a mutational target. So there's the number of different ways you can achieve this level is on the order of 100 mutations. The mutation rate is 10 to the minus 9 per base pair per genome. This is 100 times more, 10 to the minus 7 per base pair per genome. Except for the strain that lost it completely, there's a thousand different ways to lose your lover. So this happens at 10 to the minus 6. So 
as far as we can tell, it's not a co it's not a, a cooperative effect. It's it's these these different mutations happen in early, maybe in the first or second day of the experiment, and they start growing, 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 and they more or less have the same growth rate. They maybe you know if we continue this experiment another thousand generations, some of them with a slightly higher fitness will take over, and in the end it, we think the one with the highest fitness, maybe on the fourth digit, will take over. But this experiment, it's a matter of time scale. But that was something, again, we didn't expect and we don't. So that's on this time scale. It's a co-selection. Co and then there's all kinds of things called um, clonal selection. So after a while, they'll start interfering with each other. Uh, but that's, that's something striking. Um, Ken. Ah, in, in nature. In nature, you mean? Nature. Yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, it's a really nice question. So in this experiment, it looks like 60,000 is optimal for 0.6 millimolar or half a millimolar. But the thing is, in nature, so th in nature, what's the difference between this and nature? In nature, um, you, the amount of lactose is not constant over time. You sometimes have it. Most of the time, you don't have it. So here in the lab, we found a nice fitness function for, uh, for, not for a very constant situation. So... Now, when you look at nature, you'll see that um, it hap you know, sometimes, I think the way it looks is sometimes you, you drank some milk and you have a lot of lactose. Most of the time you have zero. And the, this 0.6 millimolar only happens when there's lactose around. So this, this is a complicated balance. There was one step forward using these equations to calculate what happens when there's pulse-like pulse uh, levels of lactose over the environment. And that the pulse-like levels basically decrease this so that because, um, because you have lactose only for a short amount of time, you don't want to make too much of it because then you, you start, you know, you, you lose, basically. You can see that in the, in the follow-up paper to this, which is... Uh, Kaliski, 2007, I think, or something. So you can use these equations also for dynamics. So what happens in nature is more complicated. Ah, the length of the ah. the That's right. So if if the pulses are longer than three hundred generations, then you have this situation. But pulses in reality are you know within a generation. So, so uh, that's a really good question. So I want to say that in nature, to understand the ecology, it's it's uh, th these lab experiments. Always in the lab, we take the cells to uh, an artificial situation, which is can hopefully give us some some insight into the forces at play, and then g also give us the basic. Uh, understanding that we can then try to understand more complicated situations like pulses and and you know people said here co competition between species E. coli lives with thousands of other kinds of bacteria here in the gut and ten th tens of thousands of kinds of bacteria eating viruses so it's a whole ecosystem and um, look at what we did in this just one hour selection lack of operon IPTG cost benefit optimum critical uh, serial dilution multiple mutants <laughs> and it's really uh, proud of us that we could do it. I mean, uh, <laughs> I hope uh, I was clear. And uh, we can uh, finish by taking a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Thank you very much. <laughs>